Now, in these difficult times that I've been calling the quarantinis, let's face it, we've all been glued to our laptops, TVs, phones and consoles. So, having both top-notch security and access to the best entertainment from around the world to stop you going completely insane is a must. This is where a top quality VPN service like this video's sponsor Surfshark absolutely nails it. Surfshark not only encrypts your personal information so that it's completely secure, but it has its very own hacklock system which scans various databases and lets you know if any of your personal information, like emails and passwords, are being used anywhere you haven't authorised. It also blocks pop-ups and any malware, allows you to use two different VPN services simultaneously for even greater security, and it never logs any of your browsing info, so it's truly anonymous. But my personal favourite thing about using Surfshark is the way you can use it to watch stuff online that isn't available in your own country. Do we have any US Netflix users here pissed that you can't watch Fargo? Of course we do. It's won over 50 awards for goodness sake. It even has its own wiki page just for its awards. Well, with Surfshark, you can set your IP to the UK and watch the damn thing. But I don't want to spend a fortune on it, and I assume neither do you. So for an insane and quite frankly odd discount of 83% off plus a one month free trial, sign up to Surfshark today at surfshark.deals forward slash interesting. That's surfshark.deals forward slash interesting and use the code interesting. War? War never changes. This is true. Land, religion, money, revenge. The reasons for nations and factions going to war have largely remained the same throughout history. However, the means by which war has been conducted have clearly changed over millennia. Advances in technology in particular have taken us from the humble bows and spears used in Mesopotamia as early as 10,000 BC to the nuclear weapons and cyber warfare we see today. The same can also be said about the use of insects in warfare, a topic which has largely been overlooked in the history books, despite the huge impact these creatures have had in shaping the biggest conflicts the world has ever seen. So let's take a look at some of the most interesting and brutal moments in the history of entomological warfare and see just what part these little critters could play in future conflicts. A quick shout out to Geoffrey Lockwood's book Six Legged Soldiers, which was both the inspiration and primary source for this video. I'll chuck a link in the description in case anyone's interested in picking it up. The Christian Bible famously tells tales of insects being used as weapons in the book of Exodus. God himself unleashes his ten plagues, including those of lice, flies and locusts, upon Egypt in order to punish Pharaoh and free the Hebrews from his enslavement. Now, regardless of whether you believe that God himself caused these ailments, or even whether they took place at all, the fact that they have been written down in the annals of history shows that its author knew that insects could be utilised as weapons thousands of years ago. In fact, one of the earliest recorded cases of insects being thrust into the battlefield dates back to the Mayans around the year 2600 BCE. They are said to have created human-like dummies filled with stinging insects, which when tampered with by invading enemies, released a terrible flurry of what was most likely bees, wasps and ants onto the attackers. Yet the Mayans were also one of the first recorded civilizations to be able to use insects offensively as well as defensively in battle. The Mayan people famously created beautifully intricate pieces of ceramic artwork. However, what has been less well publicised is their subsequent use of this pottery skill in creating the first grenades in history. Creating ceramic vessels that were sturdy enough to throw at enemies, but fragile enough to break on impact, the Mayans filled these receptacles with bees, wasps and nests of dangerous ants in order to inflict injury and more importantly panic amongst their enemies. A fair while later, in the 2nd century BCE to be precise, Sanatruk II, the last king of the ancient city of Hatra in present-day Iraq, took things a little further. With Roman Emperor Septimus Severus keen to take control of the vast wealth that lay within Hatra's walls, Sanatruk called upon his army to defend the city limits with another type of frightening creature – scorpions. Supposedly sedating the arachnids using the poisonous plant monkshood, which was later used in the Middle Ages to kill body lice, Sanatruk's men filled up clay pots with the creatures. As Severus's legions approached, the defenders who had placed these clay vessels on top of the city walls unleashed thousands of scorpions upon the attackers below, forcing them into retreat. Ultimately, Hatra remained autonomous for another 50 years, and the brutal defensive methods used by its people may well have been a significant contributing factor as to why this was the case. The American Civil War claimed the lives of over 600,000 soldiers, but only a third of these casualties were caused by the fighting itself. The other two-thirds were due to disease. 
And whilst the primary cause of death for soldiers was dysentery, malaria spread by mosquitoes also played a huge role. It has been estimated that over the course of the Civil War, malaria caused over 1.3 million cases of illness, infecting over 50% of white soldiers and 80% of black soldiers every year from 1861 to 1865. Now this accounted for just 10,000 of the actual death toll, but had a much bigger impact on the war, as the most impressive leaders understood the importance of turning this turmoil into a weapon. In the spring of 1861, the Union was confident that taking the Confederate capital of Richmond, Virginia would lead to a quick and successful end to the war. Under the leadership of General McClellan, the North troops made their way to Yorktown, just a few miles from Richmond, with very limited resistance from opposing forces. However, Southern General Joseph E. Johnston, knowing that the Union soldiers had just reached the Chickahominy River, changed tactics. He purposely kept the Union soldiers pinned down in this area, as he knew that with the river present, as well as the trenches and pits caused by warfare, there was a good chance that disease would spread. And it did. With a severely ill soldier requiring more attention than a dead one, obviously, the Union had to retreat as they were losing roughly a regiment every single day. Whilst this case clearly didn't decide the outcome of the war, it showed that the best military leaders could exploit insect-borne disease to their advantage. In 1935, the Japanese Army's chief medical officer, Shiro Ishii, set up what would later become known as the infamous Unit 731. Under the title of the Epidemic Prevention and Water Purification Department, Ishii used a remote group of villages in the Pingfang region of the puppet state of Manchuria as the home for some of the most notorious and disturbing biological tests to have ever been carried out on humans. Surrounded by a 15-foot high wall, guarded by high-voltage power lines, Ishii injected prisoners with strains of some of the most deadly pathogens carried by insects, including the plague. He was constantly trying to find out the most effective ways to incorporate these diseases into weapons, and in doing so, created the Yuji Bomb. These were vessels made from porcelain, filled with thousands of carefully farmed plague-ridden fleas. In fact, over the course of the 10-year span where Unit 731 was operational, it is estimated that around half a billion fleas were farmed each year. The Japanese army used these diseased flea bombs on over a dozen Chinese towns and villages during the early 1940s, with the most devastating attack on Kuzo in October 1940, which is estimated to have killed upwards of 50,000 people who were infected with bubonic plague. It is thought that all in all, around 100,000 Chinese civilians died as a result of the Yuji bombing raids. However, the true number will never be known. So, what does the future of entomological warfare have in store? There are plenty of risk factors that could have disastrous effects on the global economy. For example, the Asian longhorn beetle first detected in New York City in 1996 is thought to have the potential to destroy 35% of all tree canopies in US cities, and if not dealt with, could cause an estimated $669 billion in damages. Yet, one of the most interesting uses for insects in the future of warfare doesn't actually involve real insects at all. In what is known as biomimetics, the goal is to create what are essentially robots which utilise some of the incredible functions natural organisms have, while avoiding their flaws and inconsistencies. The US Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, has been working on a number of different projects in this field, with one of the most promising being its Offensive Swarm-enabled Tactics Programme. The aim of this particular project is to use the attributes of flying insects to create a swarm of micro-mechanical flying insects which can then be used for a variety of military-related applications. These could include detecting IEDs and locating injured soldiers, but also have some more aggressive potential applications in the fields of espionage and even search and destroy missions. Similarly, engineers at the University of California, Berkeley, and at the University of Connecticut, amongst others, have been creating a cyborg cockroach. They have been harnessing the incredible attributes that cockroaches have, i.e. being pretty much indestructible, and being able to move over pretty much any terrain due to their legs having an amazing tripod gait and an extremely low centre of gravity. The uses of such insect-inspired robots are endless, but in the future of conflict, Having a pretty much indestructible robot cockroach on your side certainly wouldn't harm your chances of success. <laughs>